Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, go ahead and find your seats and uh, stand with us as we sing. Uh, go tell it on the mountain. I'm so excited about doing some Christmas songs together. And this part of this song, um, it says, it talks about the shepherds. And I just can't imagine that moment when the shepherds received the news of the promise fulfilled that Jesus had come. And it just reminds me that Jesus, our Lord, he fulfills his promises. And we can trust um, in that every moment, even in the middle of difficulties. So uh, I just pray that he'll give us boldness to continue to tell others of, of who he is, his goodness, and that we can trust in him in that way. So let's sing this song together. Go tell it on the mountain. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Oh, go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born.
Uh, so Christmas is right around the corner. Uh, we will be having our Christmas Eve services. This year we'll be having two services, so a 4 o'clock and a 5.30. So it'll be great, but I would love to uh, have everybody invite somebody, and uh, let's get this place packed. All right, so Miniatures All Classic, this is the first annual. Uh, I know Tom Almas is very excited about this, so uh, he is the point of contact. But we, we are having, and this is open to the community, it's open to our neighbors, we would love to get people out in here and just have a, have a break where they can uh, do some Miniatures All. It will be biblically themed. Uh, did I get this right? So we can. Oh, no, it's weird. Hang on. Oh well. Anyway, the first nine holes will be the New Testament or the Old Testament. That would make sense if it's New Testament. But it's not. Yeah. But I can't tell. Here we go. Anyway, uh, so it'll be New Testament, Old Testament, and uh, you can do it as individuals, or you can get together with your small groups. Uh, and get a group together, but they will be themed out. You can do whatever, anything from the Bible. Uh, Noah's Ark, uh, Jesus walking on water, but it's themed, and it's just to get people out and get some activity that we have been lacking uh, recently. So that's going to be pretty awesome. That will be January 15th, and that will come quickly. So we do need uh, you to reach out and let Tom almost know what hole you want to sponsor and kind of what your theme will be. Dana, where's Dana? There's Dana back here. Dana is an awesome musician and uh, produces some CDs that are awesome with Christmas music. So we had them last year. This year we'll have them again. Uh, they'll be upstairs for sale, and you can stop by and grab those if you'd like. And uh, we have offering available if you uh, are a member and would like to give. This, uh, we have it at the baskets by the doors, and then you can go online since we're we're not... Uh, passing anything to take, so uh, you can go to encompass.church slash give. Uh, it's pretty simple and easy, and once you do it, it's kind of all set up and pretty cool. So uh, that is all I have. I know, no round of applause. So uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we, we come to you this morning. We are so thankful to be here. Lord, uh, we wake up every morning, and here in Colorado, we have sunshine most of the time and blue skies, and it just screams your glory of who you are and your creation. And we are so thankful for what you do for us, Lord. May we not forget. Lord, may we not forget who you are, that you sit on the throne, that you are in control. May we share that light and hope that we have um, in a world that needs it more now than ever. Uh, may we, we represent you and uh, have that smile on our face because no matter where we're at or what's going on, Lord, we have you. And we know that you have us. So we are thankful for that. I thank you for everyone here today, Lord. I ask that you just uh, watch over this message that we're about to hear from Pastor Kevin. <laughs> and uh, may it speak to every one of us uh, through the word, Lord, as you, you direct it for each and one, every one of us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing this next song together? O come, Emmanuel.
birds and poor shepherds in fields as they bow your heads with me. Father God, we are grateful for the opportunity to come and worship your son. And as we enter into this Christmas season, I think this year, most of us feel an extra need for a taste of your presence. And so as we explore your word, we pray that you will encourage us. The story is familiar, and yet there are so many elements to it that you use to form us into the kind of people that you want us to be. Do that this morning, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. It's good to be back with you today after several weeks off. Thank you to Stuart Stanton for covering for me for a couple of weeks. If you are a guest here, and I have not met you, I'd love to meet you after the service is over. If you're a guest out in the parking lot listening on FM, or if you're watching on video, you are special to us as well, and we're honored that you chose to worship with us this morning. My name is Kevin Clark. I'm the pastor here at Encompass Church, and uh, this morning we are going to be starting a brand new series that we're calling Lineage. Uh, Let me tell you a story before we get started on our text here. 
It comes from a book written by two men, Gary Nash and Graham Hodges, and the book is called Friends of Liberty, A Tale of Patriots, Revolutions, and the Betrayal that Divided a Nation. And in the book, they tell the story of two friends who served during the American Revolution. The story says this, in March 1798, a man named Thaddeus Kuschusko, a hero of both the American and Polish revolutions, and Thomas Jefferson, vice president of the United States, huddled in a cramped second story room in Philadelphia to write a will centered on the Polish hero's sizable American estate. Kosciusko, who had traveled from Poland to serve with the Continental Army in the United States for seven years in their fight against the British, had been promoted to brigadier general and had returned to the United States after some time away to a hero's welcome. Before he was to depart for Paris in the next several days, he and Jefferson created a will which would allow for the disposal of $15,000, which was the back pay that Kuzchesko had earned during his seven years fighting with the Americans. And that will was designed to kick into effect if he died. The two men labored together to produce a document which had the potential to alter American history. Kuzchesko's first version which has some awkward wording because English was not his first language, showed his thoughts on the abolition of slavery. It said this, I beg Mr. Jefferson that in the case I should die without any other will or testament, that he should buy out of my money so many black Americans and free them that the remaining sum should be sufficient to give them education and provide for their maintenance, and that each should know before the duty of a citizen in the free government, that he must defend his country against foreign as well as internal enemies who would wish to change the Constitution for the worse, to enslave them by degree afterwards, and that each one should have a good and human heart sensible to the sufferings of others. Each one must be married and have 100 acres of land with instruments and cattle for cultivation and know how to manage and govern it well, as well as to know how to behave with neighbors, always with kindness and ready to help them. The book goes on and says, in this unconventional but emotion-packed will, Kosciusko express the convictions and commitments that made him such an admirable man for black Americans in that era. Drawing on his long-standing belief that the downtrodden could prosper, peasants as well as slaves, if given their freedom under favorable conditions, he tried to promote universal liberty and give Thomas Jefferson the opportunity to lead the United States in a quest to remove the stain of slavery from the new nation. A second revised will, entirely in Kosciusko's hand like the first, included a change of immense significance. Rather than the vague reference in the original version to use his legacy to free, quote, so many black Americans, unquote, the rewritten will specified, I do hereby declare and direct that should I make no other testamentary disposition of my property in the U.S., I hereby authorize my friend Thomas Jefferson to employ the whole amount thereof in purchasing black Americans from among his own or any other's slaves. Jefferson agreed to be the executor as well as the beneficiary of the will because he himself owned slaves. Jefferson endorsed Kuzchusko's scheme with a full heart and called the Polish man the truest son of liberty I have ever known. For Jefferson, a promise at any time was a serious matter, but given freely under these conditions, it was to be held sacred. 
And for the next 20 years, Jefferson did not waver in his commitment to his Polish friend. How many of you have even heard of this person? How interesting. Yes, me neither. Today we start a brand new three-week series that I've said is called Lineage. The story of the first Christmas is found primarily in the New Testament, although there are references to it in prophetic words in the Old Testament, and primarily in the books that we call now the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke. Matthew tells us how an angel visited Joseph, who was to become the earthly father of Jesus, and told him that he should go ahead and marry the pregnant Mary. Matthew also tells us about the wise men's visit, the Magi, and tells us that after they left, that Joseph took Mary and Jesus to Egypt where it would be safe until Herod died. Luke tells us how an angel visited Mary and told her that she was to miraculously become pregnant and be the mother of the Messiah. Luke also tells us the story of the shepherds and how on the night of Jesus' birth they were visited by an angel army which told them about the birth of the Messiah. And Luke also tells us how Joseph and Mary took Jesus to the temple after the appropriate amount of time to be dedicated as a firstborn son. So for the most part, Matthew and Luke tell us different pieces of the story, but there's one area in which they overlap. Each one of them gives us a genealogy, a list of the family line leading to the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Now, in most places, those two genealogies, well, in some places, those two genealogies line up perfectly. In other places, they do not. And so it is interesting to ask the question, why embedded in the Christmas story in two places do we find the family line of the Christ? Why were they included? Why are they different? And what do they tell us about Christmas? So over the next several weeks, we're going to explore those questions. And today I want to kick us off by reading the genealogy found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. And I warn you ahead of time, it's a lot of names. It says this, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah, the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar. And Perez, the father of Hezron. And Hezron, the father of Ram. And Ram, the father of Amminadab. And Amminadab, the father of Nishan. And Nishan, the father of Salmon. He's a Jewish man. He's not a fish. And Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab. And Boaz, the father of Obed, by Ruth. And Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse, the father of David, the king. And David was the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. And Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. And Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. And Abijah, the father of Asaph. And Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram, and Joram, the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah, the father of Jotham, and Jotham, the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh, the father of Amos, and Amos, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconiah, and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. And no, we're not done. And after the deportation to Babylon... Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel, and Shealtiel the father of Zerubbabel, and Zerubbabel the father of Abiud, and Abiud the father of Eliakim, and Eliakim the father of Azor, and Azor the father of Zadok, and Zadok the father of Akim, and Akim the father of Eliad, and Eliad the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Methon, and Methon the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called 
Christ. So all, you're applauding, but you have no idea if I pronounced any of those names correctly. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. And from David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Christ, 14 generations. So Matthew gives us a list of 41 fathers and sons. And I know for a handful of you, uh, this was like a bad history class. You had flashbacks, you closed your eyes, you hoped it would go away. Um, and so I'm sorry if I did that to you, but stick with me because this, I think, is worth it. The question is, why did Matthew, and Luke also includes a list like this, why did Matthew include this in his gospel? In Matthew's case, he wrote this gospel to convince his fellow Jews, brothers and sisters, in faith that Jesus was their promised, long-awaited Messiah. Now, the Jews knew from Scripture that the Messiah would come from the line of Abraham and from the royal house, and the, or the line, rather, of King David. So how did they know that? Well, in Genesis, God tells Abram, who is later renamed Abraham, that he's going to bless him. It says this in Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So God says to Abram, go to the land I'm going to show you, and I am going to bless you. But not only you, through you all families on earth will be blessed. Now the Jews did the math and realized really the only way that that could happen would be that that was a reference to the Messiah that has been promised to us and that he would be the one who did the blessing of the whole world. <coughs> Pardon me. So he had to come from Abraham's line. But he also had to come from King David's line because we find in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, that Nathan the prophet speaks from God to David and says this to David, and your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So God promised David that someone from his line would be on the throne forever. The only way that could happen is if the Messiah himself was being referenced here, who will be on the throne forever. The only way that could happen would be if the Messiah came from David's line. So Matthew begins his book intended to show Jews that Jesus is the Messiah with a genealogy that shows that Jesus descended from the people they all knew he would have to descend from if he was the actual Messiah. He descended from Abraham and David. Now, we could spend weeks on going through all the names in the list, and we do not have time for that. So in this short series, I want to focus on some people who would have captured the attention of the original Jewish readers, people they would not expect to see in the list. I want to focus specifically on the women who are listed in the genealogy. Now, the ancient Jews recorded a lot of genealogies. If you flip through not just the New Testament, but if you flip through the Old Testament, you find all kinds of long-term and short-term genealogical lists. But one thing you will notice is that most of the names are men. The only time you really see a woman's name listed is when there is a specific and important reason to mention her name. Matthew had important reasons for mentioning the names of the women in his list. Who were those women? Well, there were five of them. The first is Tamar. Her twins were fathered by Judah. The second is Rahab. She lived in Jericho, and she married Salmon. 
The third is Ruth. She was a Moabite. She came and lived in Bethlehem and married Boaz. The fourth in Matthew's list is only described as the wife of Uriah. But we know from the Old Testament they're speaking of Bathsheba. The fifth is the mother of Jesus, Mary. Now, why are these five women named in Matthew's list? Clearly, every man had a mother, and so there is a wife or a mother attached to every name. But they're not all listed. Why were these five singled out for specific mention? Part of the reason is because every single one of them was stigmatized. She was either an outsider or in the eyes of her neighbors, she was guilty of a sin or perhaps even both. Yet every one of them, by the grace of God, found a place in the line of Jesus. Everyone was looking for something specific much like the characters we find in the first Christmas story. And every one of them is used by God to show the world that no one is outside of God's plan of salvation. Now, last year, we spent four weeks going through the story of Ruth, and we tied her story to the Christmas story. So we won't be spending time on Ruth in this particular series. And we will touch on Mary each week as she fits into the original Christmas story. So that leaves us with three remaining names, Tamar, Rahab, and Bathsheba. So this morning, I want us to spend what time is left talking about the story of Tamar, or Tamar is the way you may have learned how to pronounce her name. So you can hold your place in Matthew if you'd like, or you can just flip back and forth. We'll be in Genesis chapter 38. Now, Genesis chapter 38 tells us the story of a man named Judah. He was one of the 12 sons of Jacob, the original founders of the 12 tribes of Israel. And Judah also plays a prominent role in the line of Jesus. But in the prior chapter, in chapter 37, we find out that Judah's character was not that stellar. He led his brothers to sell his younger brother into slavery. Now that was to save him from death, so that was admirable, but the act of selling him to slavery and then telling their father that Joseph was dead uh, shows that he was capable of great deception and of thinking primarily of his own needs over the needs of those who were his family. But then we transition into chapter 38, and the story changes very dramatically. Here we just find out about Judah himself in isolation with his own immediate family. We find out that Judah married a foreigner, a Canaanite woman. We're never told her name that I could discover in scripture, but she is referred to as the daughter of Shua. Now, when Shua's daughter and Judah married, they had three sons. And hopefully I'm pronouncing this right, but you won't know. So their names are Ur, Onan, and Shelah. When I read that list, I thought it's the, the first name makes it sound like I'm trying to think of the other two. Ur, Onan, and Shelah. But that's not the case. That was his name. Um, it is very clear from Scripture that Judah's act of marrying a Canaanite woman was not the best plan. We know that his great-grandfather Abraham did not want his grandfather Isaac to marry a Canaanite. And so the idea of marrying outside of your faith was something that was not looked highly upon. But for Judah, apparently he really wasn't all that worried about that. Now when Judah's oldest son, Ur, reached marriageable age, Judah found him a wife, a woman named Tamar. Now scripture doesn't explicitly say if she was a member of their extended large clan or if she was a foreigner, a Canaanite, an outsider to their family. Now, first century Jewish commentaries and those that came over the next several hundred years after that say that Tamar was part of the what would then become the Jewish line, and so she was part of the extended family. But I actually think that she probably wasn't, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Scripture tells us, chapter 38, that Ur was evil. 
Genesis says that the Lord put Ur to death. So enter the second son, Onan. Now in the ancient world, if a man who was married died childless, the cultural tradition would be for the next brother in line to marry that woman and father a son, a single son, who would belong to the dead brother. And that son would then inherit any kind of estate that the dead brother was entitled to receive. And that custom actually became part of later part of Mosaic law, but it was also popular within the other cultures around where the Jews lived and their nation eventually formed. So when Ur died, Judah gave Ur's wife, Tamar, to Onan. So Onan could father a child who would carry on Ur's name and have his estate. But Onan wasn't stupid. He knew that Ur was the firstborn. He got a double portion of the father's estate. And so if he did not father a child who would take that inheritance, then that inheritance, along with his own inheritance, would all come to him. So chapter 38 tells us that he cleverly did not make it possible for Tamar to get pregnant. And scripture says that this selfish act was also wicked in God's eyes. And so the Lord put Onan to death too. Now, knowing that his third son, Shalah, was now obligated to marry Tamar and father a son for his firstborn, Judah was alarmed. The other two husbands had died, and he was not sure why that had happened. And so Judah sent Tamar back to her father's house with the idea that she would wait to marry Shalah when he was older. Tamar waited a long time. Look at Genesis chapter 38, beginning in verse 12. It says, in the course of time, that's an expression that means a long period, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers, he and his friend Hira the Adulamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and sat at the entrance to Anaim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. So Tamar had been sitting at home at her father's house, which was obviously a distance away from Judah and his clan, waiting for Judah to fulfill his promise and allow her to marry Shelah. And she waited for a long time, perhaps years, and nothing happened. Shelah grew up, she knew that, she knew he was old enough to be married, and nothing had changed. Then came the day that Tamar heard that Judah himself would be in the neighborhood. And so she changed her clothes out of the clothing which identified her as a widow, wrapped her face in a veil, which was a convention that temple prostitutes often used, and sat by the road, knowing that dressed that way, Judah would assume that she was for hire, and she was right. Now, when you and I read that story, don't you have kind of a creepy feeling? And just sort of think, wow, what kind of weird, promiscuous, gross woman would go after her father-in-law that way? And that might be a good question to ask, except for one thing. The Hittite law in the area promoted what she was doing. Now, the Hittites were a subsection of the Canaanites, and we have records of a specific Hittite law that says if a married Hittite man dies without children 
and he has a brother, the brother should father a child for him by his widow. That was convention in all the cultures of the day, but the Hittite law had an added wrinkle. If the brother dies, the dead men's father, the widow's father-in-law, should father a child for his dead son by his dead son's widow. All of a sudden, the story feels a little bit different. I don't think Tamar was a loose woman, morally opportunistic, going after what she wanted. I think Tamar was following the pagan culture of her day, and that that taught her the right thing to do. If your husband dies, and you're given to his brother, and he dies, your father-in-law is obligated to continue your husband's line. That's why I think Tamar was probably from the Canaanite culture. Now, did that make her actions right in God's eyes? No, it did not. God would have had her marry and father a child or have a child by Shelah. But it does make it a little bit more understandable what her character was like. Judah spotted Tamar, but he didn't recognize her. She had a veil on. So he thought she was a prostitute, and not just any prostitute, but a temple prostitute. And temple prostitutes, if there was a hierarchy, had a little bit higher standing than a conventional prostitute. In that day, men would sleep with temple prostitutes, not just for the pleasure, but also to guarantee fertility for their flocks and greater, um, in, their, in the things that they were growing, greater productivity in the crops that they were growing. So Judah, whose wife had died some time before and who was a little loose on following God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, probably thought, hey, I can kill two birds with one stone if I sleep with this woman. So he asked Tamar if he could spend the night with her and promised to pay her with a goat, which she did not, or he did not have at the time. So Tamar very wisely asks, what are you going to give me for collateral? I don't know if you can be trusted to bring the goat you are promising me. Now remember that Judah had promised to marry her to his third son, Shalah, and that had not happened. And so this is a very wise question on the part of Tamar, who does not have a track record, uh, or who knows Judah does not have a track record of trustworthiness. So Judah, having probably not much of value on him, decides to give her his most prized possession. He gives her what is called his signet, a seal, a piece of stone or bone that had been carved with an insignia that was unique to him and his family. And in very formal document signing sort of uh, activities, this would be used to make your mark, to put a stamp on the things that you put your name on. It says he gave her his cord. These seals were worn on a cord around your neck. And it says he also gave her his staff. Now for a shepherd, which he was, a staff was a tool that you used. But for Judah, the head of his immediate family, it also signified his identity. So what he did would be the equivalent of you and I handing our driver's license and our social security card to a stranger and walking away. Now, after they finished their business, Judah went straight home and got the goat. And Tamar, though, did not stay where he found her. She went back to her father's house and changed back into her old widow's clothes. Look at chapter 38, verses 20 to 26. It says, when Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, because he didn't want to take it himself, to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. And he asked the men of the place, where is the cult or temple prostitute who was at Enaim at the roadside? And they said, no cult prostitute has been here. We've never seen anyone here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also, the men of the place say, no cult prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own or we shall be laughed at. 
You see, I sent this young goat, and you did not find her. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, Bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, By the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, Please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah identified them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Shalah. And he did not know her again. So Judah sent his friend Hiram to pay Tamar with the goat, but she was gone. So she'd never done what she did that day before. No one had ever seen her there before. So when Hiram asked around, there was nobody who could testify that she had been there. So there was no, pardon me, no way to find her. But it says three months later, her pregnancy becomes obvious. Now, for some of you who think three months, does it show at three months? Well, I guess sometimes it does, but we find out later she's having twins. So three months, it was probably a pretty dead giveaway. She's having Perez and Zara. When that became obvious, then her immorality was reported to her father-in-law, Judah. And since she was still legally obligated to marry Shalah, she was effectively guilty of adultery. So Judah was prepared to be harsh. He probably considered her to be a problem he would like to get rid of. And here was a a fine opportunity. And so he was going to just have her executed in one of the most brutal ways possible. He was going to have her burned until she produced his seal, his cord, and his staff and announced to everyone present The man to whom these belong is the father of my children. Now, when people saw those items, there would be no way that Judah could deny that he was the father. And so he says something that none of us expect. He says, she is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Shalah. Now, what did he mean by that? She is more righteous than I. Remember the promise from God to Abram, uh, Judah's great-grandfather that I read for you just a few moments ago from Genesis chapter 12? God says, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, And him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now that promise was repeated in one form or another to Abraham, to his son Isaac, to Jacob, and was probably repeated often in storytelling by Jacob to Judah and his other sons. They knew they were meant to become a great nation out of which the world would be blessed. And you cannot become a great nation if you don't have children. In light of that promise, Judah says Tamar did the more righteous thing. Her acts help us to carry out what God has promised. My act of denying her to Shelah prohibited us from carrying out that promise. One pastor I read put it this way, Judah, the son of the chosen line, cared little to live according to God's promise and give Abraham many great-grandsons. In contrast, by faith, Tamar risked her life to add to the patriarch's progeny, even though she was not brought up knowing the Lord. Tamar, a Canaanite, taught Judah, one of the future Jews, two things. First, she taught him, do not be afraid of what might happen. Now, we have no indication that Tamar was a risk taker. 
We have no idea. There's no way to look at scripture and say, well, this is just her character. This is the way she always acted. And so this was a huge risk for her to do what she did. She knew that the inevitable outcome would be that she would become pregnant and that people would find out what had happened and that people would look down on her and that her life might actually be at risk. She could be punished. She could even be killed. But she also knew from having been in the household, the extended family of Judah and those who grew up under Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that Judah's God expected them to become a great nation. And therefore, by his own rules, she was meant to continue that line of her first husband, Ur. So although she followed a pagan practice by pursuing Judah herself as her father-in-law, she did it to fulfill the expectations of what was embedded by God into that promise, first to Abraham, then to Isaac, then to Jacob, then to Judah and his brothers. And in spite of experiencing failed promises by the very people who should be living out the idea that God keeps his promises, she taught Judah something else. Now, I started this message with a portion of a story about a man named Thaddeus Kosciusko and Thomas Jefferson. Thaddeus, the friend of Thomas Jefferson, whose will instructed Jefferson to use his money to free as many slaves as possible, died on October 15, 1817. After several years of going back and forth, Jefferson finally withdrew from his pact with Kosciusko by pleading in a Virginia court in Charlottesville that he could not serve as executor of his friend's estate and would not use his money to free his own slaves. A hundred years later, an abolitionist named William Lloyd Garrison would say this, what an all-conquering influence might have accompanied Jefferson's illustrious example if he had taken the lead to abolish slavery. One other historian wrote, the object of Kosciusko's will was lost. Had Jefferson felt stronger about the object, he might have ventured the experiment despite obstacles and the shortness of years, for the experiment of freeing the slaves was one he often commended to others, and indeed, one he may himself have first suggested to Kosciusko. Often, in this life, people we know and we trust fail to keep big promises. Jefferson failed to keep his promise to Kosciusko. And for all we know, that might have been life-altering for hundreds of thousands of of American slaves. Judah failed to keep his promise to Tamar. And for her, that was life altering. But she knew that even though people weren't keeping their promises, that the God she had been told about in her extended family was not like the people who didn't keep their promises. So by pursuing a course of action that showed faith in God's promise, she taught Judah to believe the promises of God. Regardless of how misguided we might think her methods were by our modern estimation, she acted in keeping with the belief that Judah's God would keep his promises, bless the line of Abraham, and that in the end, the entire world would be blessed. And in her case, she actually got to be in the line of the Messiah. Now, how does that fit with the Christmas story? Well, like Judah, 
There's a person in the first Christmas story who needed to hear the things that Tamar discovered. That person was Joseph, the man called to be the earthly father of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Joseph found himself in a terrible predicament, and based on what Scripture says, he was afraid. You can flip all the way back to Matthew, where we started this morning, and look at chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. When Joseph found out that Mary, who was betrothed to him, was pregnant, he was probably shocked. A betrothal was essentially the equivalent of a marriage, a commitment in which, with the exception of the physical intimacy and living with one another, you were fully interlocked with your spouse in the eyes of the law and in the eyes of culture. So when Joseph found out Mary was pregnant, it was a betrayal. And he knew immediately that he had three options. Now his first option would be just to go ahead and marry her. And in our mind, in a modern culture, we think, well, why wouldn't he just forgive her? If he loved her, and you know, there was some question about whether or not she was unfaithful, then couldn't he just set that aside and just forgive her and marry her? The reason that wasn't an, an option for Joseph is that since Joseph was a just man, a righteous man, a man who deeply wanted to follow God. And in the eyes of Jewish culture in that day, if adultery had occurred, they believed that God saw the marriage as already over. And if you stayed married, that would actually be to deny what God had dictated was true. And that would make you unfaithful to God. So just marrying her was Joseph's first option, but it carried some baggage. His second option was a public divorce. He could stand up in the town square and he could profess in front of an audience that Mary had been unfaithful and he could pronounce her his divorcee. He could divorce her publicly. In the best case scenario, from that moment on, Mary and Jesus would have been considered pariahs. They would have been people who lived under the curse of her sin. In the worst case scenario, which did not happen a lot, <coughs> pardon me, in the first century, uh, but could still happen by the law, she could have been stoned to death. Joseph, if he was godly, would recognize that this was the best option to protect his integrity, to separate himself from her sin. But Joseph loved Mary and did not want to see her disgraced. So he was left with a third option, what we would consider to be a private divorce. He could call two official witnesses to his home, but it would not be done in public. And there he would say that he was divorcing Mary without making an accusation. And without an accusation, the townspeople, the courts could not act to punish Mary. But the problem is a private divorce always carried a hint that perhaps Joseph was the father after all, and that he was trying to duck out and sneak away from the responsibility for his own sin. A private divorce meant that he would also be viewed with suspicion for the rest of his life. His reputation was at stake, and he had done nothing wrong. The life Joseph had planned for Mary and himself in his mind was over, and he was afraid. But then an angel appeared to Joseph in a dream. Look at Matthew 1, verses 20 and 21. It says, But as he considered these things, which option to use? Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. 
She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Tamar, by her example, taught Judah not to fear what might happen. An angel came to Joseph to tell him not to fear what might happen. Tamar, by her example, showed the people around her that she believed in the promise that God gave Abraham. Joseph, when he was reminded that there was a Messiah coming, and the angel said, Mary is going to give birth to him, would be reminded of the promise that God gave Abraham. The Messiah was going to come. God was going to keep his word. We see that all the way back in Tamar and Judah's time and in the time of Mary and Joseph. So for you and I, one of the lessons of the first Christmas is the lesson we find in Tamar's story. In this season, we are meant to remember, do not fear what might happen. God is not surprised by anything that happens to you and me, anything that will or has ever happened. He has everything under his control. And in this season, we are also meant to remember to believe the promises of God. And the biggest promise that Christmas gives to us is the promise of salvation from sin and death through his son. Once we belong to him, nothing can take that away from us. Now this morning, we're going to celebrate communion. And by celebrating communion, we acknowledge that the Christmas story was not an end in itself. It was the beginning of the opportunity for you and I to enter into a relationship with the same God who made a promise to Abraham and to each person in that line leading up to Jesus Christ. On the night before he was crucified, Jesus met with his disciples in an upper room to celebrate the Passover feast. Knowing what was coming, he spoke words they had never heard before in the middle of that Passover celebration. I'm going to ask you right now to go ahead, if you have not picked up a cup, you can make your way to the back of the room and pick up one of those small cups. You will find the bread in the top under the clear cellophane, and you can peel that off and take the bread out. And then there will be some purple foil underneath that that you can open for the juice when we come to that point. Paul tells us in his account of the Last Supper, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread together. Paul continues in verse 25. He says, in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. 
Now, Paul says something at the end of this passage that we don't always read, but I think it fits very well on this morning into the story that we have been investigating. Paul says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In this season, you and I do a lot of things to proclaim the Lord's birth, his first arrival. But by doing that, we are meant to remind ourselves and those who don't know that there was far more to the promise than the fact that the Messiah would arrive as a child and be laid in a manger in Bethlehem. The promise was way bigger than that. The promise is that he would take care of our sin. That he would pay the price which would enable us to be forgiven and to enter into a relationship with the God who made the promise all those years ago. I pray that in this season that you'll be reminded not only of his birth but of what came next and that like Tamar and like Joseph you will not fear and you will believe the promises would you bow your heads with me father God we thank you for your word we thank you even for strange things like lists of who fathered who that go on seemingly forever and yet god when we look closer in your word we realize that you put every single word in scripture for a reason and we're reminded that you were working way back then to move your plan forward that people like people sitting in this room who thought they were just everyday folks were playing a role in a story that would lead to blessing for all the families of the earth God, only you could pull that off. And so as we look forward to celebrating the birth of your son, may we be reminded of the promises of what came next. May we live in such a way that we point other people to those promises too. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing our final song together?
Thank, Thank you for being here with us this morning. We invite you to stick around for our uh, new adult Bible community, which will be in this room right over here. We call that the dining room sometimes. And uh, so please join us for that. I also, I believe that our student group is re-kicking off today. Is that correct? All right. So if you have teens here and they would like to join us, we'd love to have them too. So um, they're, they're upstairs right next, right down this hall here. So. Let me, Let me close this in a word of prayer, prayer and we'll go off and celebrate, celebrate the Christmas season together. together. Father God, we are grateful for your word. We are grateful for how you use it, how you use the other people around us, how you use the experiences you put us in to point us toward you. God, may we sink our hearts and our minds and our souls deeply into who your son is, why you sent him why that is of such great value to us. May we live our lives in this season in a way that points to you as the keeper of promises. Bless us this week, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. We'll see you soon.